Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today show. And today our subject matter is eczema. Um, this uh, is this chronic itchy inflammatory skin disease or skin condition, I uh, should say, is commonly found on the wrists, the face. Um, you're going to find it right around the elbow areas, behind the legs. It can show up on the arms. Um, and it's very, very common in the United States where we have anywhere from 10 to 15 percent of the U.S. population that suffers from eczema. Um, there's not a whole lot of good medical treatments for this disease or skin condition because I know personally I've experienced it and the medications and things that they put me on were in, eventually ended up being absolutely worthless and uh, could have caused me some real harm because they were steroidal treatments and things like that. So, um, so this is a subject that I know well. Um, I'd like to look at the causes, um, and they're kind of multifaceted and difficult to determine sometimes as to which one might affect you or a combination of thereof. Um, number one, I think food allergies. Um, you've got to find out what foods you're allergic to anytime you have any type of skin conditions. And that, in addition, not just food allergies, but chemical allergies, irritants. If you go into a, a department store and smell perfume and it causes you to get itchy, you got to determine what you're allergic to. Now, with food allergies, there's a 99 food panel uh, that can be done where they take your blood, they run what items, uh, and, and we look at the serum IgE, that's your response. Your, um, how your body responds to food as a chemical within it. And they can test it and find out whether you're sensitive, like in my case, to eggs, milk, soy, wheat, all those kinds of things. Um, heredity as well, because our ability and our immune system's ability to respond or over-respond is definitely genetically passed on. And this is a condition in which if one or more parents or grandparents has it generally, some, you're going to have it. You're going to have a good um, uh, chance of having it, provided the other factors come into play. Stress. Stress. When people are extremely stressed, they're very acidic. And when the body gets acidic, it allows things like yeast, your immune system gets suppressed, everything gets out of balance. That can cause eczema to come to light especially when you have nutrient deficiencies, which primarily when we see fatty acid deficiencies, the lack of good fats in the diet. You don't know how many times I've asked people, do you eat nuts and avocados and things? And most of them say, yeah, I eat peanuts. Well, peanuts aren't nuts, they're legumes, number one. Number two, they're not eating any of the other good fats in their diet. They're eating tons of inflammatory fats that raise aeroconic acid inflammation. And so what happens then is they'll get eczema, skin condition, joint pain. It shows itself in a lot of different ways. So we need to have more good fats in our diet. Walnuts, almonds, pecans, sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, avocados, fish and less of the saturated fats that you're going to get in milk and dairy and um, uh, meat source fats. So looking for the leaner cuts of meat. Um, a balanced immune system. What you're going to find is in the immune system issue, there's, it, the immune system gets decreased, which uh, the, uh, the white blood cells decrease down, which in turn, your ability to deal with prostaglandin and these bad fats hmm, rises and then your ability to metabolize and use the good fats lowers. So um, we got to get immune system uh, regulated as best we can with proper nutrition and dietary supplements as well too. So if you're going to have a immune problem, chances are good you're gonna, it's going to end up showing itself somewhere on your skin eventually. Yeast and candida infections. With all the sugar intake all the junk intake that I'm seeing everybody, I have more kids coming now with eczema than I've ever seen before. And what that means eventually, since their immune system is chronically having to react and respond to all this yeast and bacteria and all of that, it eventually could make the immune system become an autoimmune system problem, where the immune system becomes doesn't know how to regulate itself, especially if there's nutritional deficiencies. Use of antibiotics and steroids. Like, uh, like they gave me when I had eczema or I had antibiotics when I had bad, bron bad bronchitis. They never gave me the good bacterias so my body, 
when, it, when all the antibiotics destroyed a good portion of my good bacteria, my immune system could no longer modulate and regulate. So therefore, using the antibiotics or the steroids, particularly like for asthma and that, those types of uh, disorders and pregnisone, um, that are used oftentimes for people that have chronic allergies. Benadryl, all those kinds of things can cause a yeast overgrowth and a destruction of your good bacteria, which in turn can cause eczema. And other skin disorders such as psoriasis, if you've ever seen people with those patchy things um, on their elbows and their knees, psoriasis. Now, when we also look at how the body gets rid of its toxins, through the liver, through the skin, through the bowel, a lot of people are not having adequate amounts of bowel movements. They're not going. I have people come in and say, I only go once every five days, and I'm like horrified because you're supposed to be having a bowel movement twice a day, at least two or three times a day. I'm not talking loose, I'm talking regular bowel movements. If the body doesn't detoxify, you reabsorb all these toxins, and guess what? It's going to use the skin to get rid of the, uh, the toxins. When we're talking about diet when a person has eczema or for prevention of eczema or keeping eczema from coming back, we've got to have lots of good water. Eight ounces every, should, every day. Eight ounces every two hours <laughs> um, you want to have. You're going to avoid the allergy producing food. So if you know that you're sensitive to some sort of food, please stay away from it. Um, and I'll um, give a list here of, of some of the foods that can cause an issue uh, with it. But um, eating fatty acid foods such as nuts, flax seeds, um, all the avocados, what I talked about earlier, walnuts, almonds, pecans, those good fats increase prostaglandin 1 production, which enables you to deflame, to bring down inflammation. Lots of veggies. Remember how I talked about the acid alkali? A lot of people are under stress and they're too acidic. Well, if we can alkali the blood with lots of good fruits and vegetables, and, and you can go online and punch in alkaline producing foods, you can get a good gist of what things are alkaline producing and eat more of those. And this goes whether or not you have arthritis, gout, any inflammatory or any pain, alkaline the body is very, very important. Eating lots of cultured or sour products like sauerkraut, they're lactic acid inducing. So kefir, probiotics, those types of things to maintain the bacteria levels. Very, very important to maintain overall health and detoxification of the bowel. Now when we're talking about foods to avoid, this is a hard one, particularly if, if you're not like me and you're not just shopping the perimeter of the grocery store, but you're adding all these crackers and all the stuff that are full of chemicals, not, you know, non-organic junk, um, you're going to have problems. So you've got to eliminate all foods that have additives, chemicals. If you read the box and you don't know what it is or you can't find out what it is, please don't buy it if you have any skin issues. Eliminate all food foods that cause allergies, as I mentioned before, and have those blood panel tests so you know what foods to avoid. Do not eat saturated fats or solid fats. That means fats that at air temperature are solid. So that would be your french fry fats, that would be <laughs> your meat fats, um, any of types of fats that solidify, your bacon fats, mostly meat fats and saturated fats. Uh, they interfere with your fatty acid metabolism in the liver and throughout the body and therefore raise your inflammation and you're not going to be able to deal with the inflammatory aspects of eczema. Avoid sugar, spicy foods, dairy, caffeine, strawberries, believe it or not, chocolate, alcohol, and soy products in addition to the foods that you might be allergic to. For some reason these seem to feed more eczema uh, as far as inflammation is concerned, so try to avoid them. When we're talking about supplements, you know, there's uh, not a whole lot actually, um, because a lot of it has to do with diet. Um, essential fatty acids, those good fats in the diet, the nuts I talked about, well there's also supplements that can be very helpful that I know I use that are helpful for reduction of inflammation. Uh, a couple of tablespoons of flax oil a day, or at least a tablespoon of fish oil a day where you're getting at least 1.8 grams of EPA, 
which works out to about a tablespoon of fish oil a day, and there's some good tasting ones out there that can really help reduce eczema as well as psoriasis. Um, borage or evening primrose oil. We're talking about a balance between omega-3s and omega-6s, and borage oil is a natural plant source omega-6, which can help stabilize hormones and help with the healing on the skin. Ester C with bioflavonoids. Hmm. Um, eczema can leave scars because uh, it's pretty deep within the skin. So keeping the vitamin C levels help the collagen matrix and they help the skin tissue to repair. So keeping C always up, whether you're talking about skin conditions, aging, anything that involves uh, tissue that is collagen based, you always keep C levels up. Enzymes. Now, a lot of studies support that a lot of eczema sufferers have poor digestion, and a lot of it can be attributed to the lack of stomach acids. So whenever, <laughs> and at one point, I had a doctor try to put me on an acid redux drug. Now, mind you, I'm an A blood type. I don't break down proteins. I don't break down meat very well. And you throw me on a drug like that, and I'm not going to break down much foods. So when you're betaine hydrochloride deficient, you don't break down fats and you don't break down proteins. And when you don't break those down, they enter the digestive tract and they tear it apart. They make you so inflamed. So please be very cautiously aware. And I know Ralph has brought up some studies regarding these acid redux drugs and all the side effects and long-term usage. But enzymes, enzymes, enzymes. And if you are someone who, like me, don't, does not digest fats and proteins very well, chances are good you're betaine hydrochloride deficient. That will help you break your food down better. A good multiple vitamin with B vitamins, adding in an extra B vitamin maybe later in the day. The B vitamins help skin tissue heal. They help you better deal with stress. Now, we want to look for allergen-free ones. So going in and pulling one off your local warehouse, a one daily type of vitamin that's got 12 to 14 toxic substances and dyes, is not my idea of a good multiple vitamin. You need to go into a good health food store, find an allergen-free type of multivitamin, and utilize that instead. Zinc. Um, good studies on zinc, 50 milligrams a day, can help skin tissue repair, help the immune system. 50 milligrams with a, maybe about a 1 or 2 milligrams of copper until your symptoms subside. Acidophilus probiotics. Remember how I talked about how steroids and good bacteria can destroy these, the, uh, steroids and uh, antibiotics can destroy the good bacteria? Well, so can fluoride in the water, so can pesticides, chemicals, all those wonderful things. So good bacteria, the probiotics when you're suffering from eczema, are vital in order to bring the immune system back into balance. Natural vitamin E helps the skin tissue heal, and I've seen people apply and utilize vitamin E topical. There are some creams out there that can be utilized for eczema, and you can find them in your natural health food store. I know I have them in mine, which are very helpful for the relief as well. Homeopathics. Now, homeopathics is very specific as to symptoms, and with eczema, some people have white patches, it weeps, you know, they have red, whatever. And depending on what your issue is and whether it feels better with hot or cool, there are some homeopathic remedies out there that can be very helpful for eczema that can reduce uh, some of the symptoms. A lot of people that have mold and yeast allergies also will have eczema, and there's some great homeopathics that can help with that as well, too. Uh, burdock root. It's really rich in something called inulin. Now, you can buy inulin by itself, but burdock root is a blood purifier, and it's been shown to help with eczema as well. Uh, quercetin. Quercetin is a, it blocks mast cell production and helps the allergic uh, allergy responses. Um, I know when we first moved here, my husband had a lot of allergies, and I did too. The quercetin along with the vitamin C really helped, until our bodies could be custom, uh, become accustomed to this area, helped a lot with their allergies. I still take them because, once again, I have eczema and allergies, and the quercetin does stop some of my allergic reactions. Now, the last thing on the list here I have is a yeast cleanse. I think a good portion of people that suffer from eczema have tons of yeast and potentially parasites. So in some of the testings that the doctors can perform, they can perform uh, profile testings not just on your allergy and your essential fatty acids and your vitamin mineral balances, but they can also conduct tests on your yeast as well as your parasites. 
or you're possibly having parasites. Now, they come with symptoms, oftentimes digestion, itchy skin, but I think eczema is one of the strongest symptoms that people tend to have a very high yeast level along with parasites. So I have personally found, as well as um, um, many of my customers, found effective doing yeast and parasite cleanses. Uh, they clean things out or even doing whole body bowel cleanses, getting the body to detoxify, remove things, kill off the yeast, kill off the parasites, because these parasites and yeasts produce toxins and your body can become itchy and hypersensitive to the toxins that these yeast and parasites produce. Um, once again, I want to iterate that oftentimes, well, the majority of time, me personally and others that I've spoken with have very little success with the cortical steroid creams and those type of, types of things. And remember the cortical steroids thin the skin. So if you have any eczema on your face, you never want to use it on that. I would really look to uh, review some of this and discuss some of this with a natural healthcare professional. Most physicians aren't familiar with this. And then do some of your research on your own to determine maybe if some of this might help. Most of the items, or all the items I've listed here are available at any good health food store. Next, we're going to be moving on to the fitness portion of our show. Thank you very much. Hi, welcome to the fitness portion of our show. And today I'm going to work on a movement that's going to help loosen up the hips a little bit, particularly if you sit all day long and you get kind of stiff and they get out of alignment. And what this can do is it can help strengthen a little bit of the hip flexors. It's a very basic movement and you can grab a chair if you need to. Hopefully I'm able to maintain my balance. But what it is basically is we're just going to rotate the hip flexors around in a circular motion. And as the camera is going to show, what we're going to do is we're going to point off to the side just to get a little bit of balance. And then we just basically rotate the hip around and then we reverse it. This is not a complicated exercise and it feels really, really good. As a matter of fact, I'm going to reverse it because it feels so good for me. But all we're doing is we're rotating the hip flexor around and you can put your hand on your hip. You can feel the tendon and ligaments move when you do this. If you're not able to maintain your balance, you can just do it this way. But this also too is an old, and it reminded me of an old ballet warm-up move that we used to do. And also it's a balance move as well. But that'll help loosen up the hip flexors a little bit so that you're maybe not quite so stiff in that particular area. Next, we're going to be moving on to the research portion of our show. Thank you. Welcome to the research portion of our show, and with this is Ralph Torciano. Ralph? And thank you for the intro. Many of you have asked where I post these research articles, because a lot of times people like to be able to review them after the show or see what's coming up in the next show. Well, I wrote it down the back here. You can find the research articles on vit.bz. That's www.v as in Victor, I, T as in Tom, dot B as in Boy, Z is a zebra. You can find them on the bottom right corner and they're all in PDF format and they go back about three and a half years. Currently there's 97 news reports I've done so far. Now to the research. All right, a new use for something for osteoarthritis. I should say new use, but a new protective measure that can be done outside of the traditional painkillers that they usually do or hip replacement. Well, they found out that fruits and vegetables that are high basically in a substance called allium or allium vegetables seem to have an incredibly protective effect uh, from the enzymes that damage the joints in the case of osteoarthritis. This was published in the BMC Mucoskeletal Disorders Journal. What they discovered was this. They took 1,000 female healthy twins and followed them, had no symptoms of arthritis, and followed them for quite some time. 
They found that a compound in garlic, outside the allium, called diethyl disulfate, limited the amount of cartilage damming enzymes when introduced into human cartilage cells. Now they followed the twins over time to see exactly why they were not getting osteoarthritis as often as possibly somebody else. And they found out and they located directly to the consumption of allium type vegetables, in particular garlic. So if you have a history of osteoarthritis or something like that in the family or you begin to come down with it, really look at basically introducing garlic into your diet. It seems to have a very positive effect. And again, published in a respected journal called the BMC Mucoskeletal Disorders Journal. Something interesting. Now it's back to one of my favorite supplements, beetroot juice. Not beet juice, but beetroot juice. Again, more research coming out on it, and this was published in the Journal of Applied Physiology. Real important that all your science and data is footnoted, so this way just not someone's opinion. Well, outside of this journal, they found out that people that took beetroot juice were able to exercise up to 16% longer. And they also said, too, they looked at low intensity exercise and found that test subjects used less oxygen while walking, effectively reducing the effort it took to walk by 12%. This is for people that have a hard time moving, difficulty on oxygen tanks or some sort of breathing respirator. They found that beetroot juice can be very helpful for that outside of just athletes. They said, when consumed, beetroot juice has two marked physiological effects. Firstly, it widens blood vessels, reducing blood pressure and allowing more blood flow. Secondly, it affects muscle tissue, reducing the amount of oxygen needed by muscles during activity. Again, beet root juice, not just beet juice. Following on, and back to exercise. One of the greatest things you could do uh, when basically trying to reduce your risk of death from prostate cancer, if it's even a consideration, is exercise. Not just a little bit, but by a lot. This came out of the advanced online edition of the Journal of Clinical Oncology. They studied 2,705 men for 18 years. And this is what they discovered, that men who did low intensity to moderate intensity workouts for about 90 minutes of an entire week, we're talking just a little less than 15 minutes a day of walking, reduced their chance of dying of prostate cancer by 41% over those that did not. 41%. Then they found out that individuals who did high intensity workouts, and they basically more during the week or maybe for an hour or so, reduced their chance of dying 61% of prostate cancer. And basically, let me back that up again. The 46% was basically dying of any cause. That was just 15 minutes of walking per day or a little less. But as far as reducing risk of prostate cancer, vigorous exercise, reduce the chance of dying by 61%. That speaks volumes. All right, now for one supplement which hasn't really made it much in the news at all, but seems to have a real positive effect, actually the first substance to have a positive effect in regards to ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. And of all things, spirulina. They found out that spirulina prepared to provide a neuroprotective support for dying motor neurons in mouse models, or models my mice that had ALS. They found out a dietary supplement which shown as spirulina delayed the onset of motor symptoms and disease progression, reducing inflammatory markers in motor neuron death in the ALA mice. Again, that was just spirulina. Sometimes they may use blue-green algae. This was reported in the Open Tissue Engineering and Regenerative Medical Journal that just came out December 21st. Now, an interesting as far as, far as a faux pas or false step. They were associating a virus with chronic fatigue syndrome and also prostate cancer. Well, they found out they made a huge mistake. When they tried to culture viruses to find out exactly what caused chronic fatigue or prostate cancer, they accidentally contaminated with uh, basically DNA from mice. The reason being is they try to use the DNA from mice to basically progress or speed up disease progression. Well, they found out that XMRV, the disease which they thought caused chronic fatigue, 
and this was basically published back in 2009 when associated with chronic fatigue, was wrong. They discovered out of the University of College of London that XMRV was just a virus contaminant that came from mice. Had nothing to do with chronic fatigue, had nothing to do with prostate cancer, is basically was contaminant. For a year and a half, we've been trying to fight those two diseases, looking for this virus, when all it was was something which got stuck in the line of a petri dish. They said our conclusion is quite simple. XMRV, XMRV is not the cause of chronic fatigue syndrome. All our evidence shows that the sequences from the virus genome and cell culture have contaminated human chronic fatigue syndrome and prostate cancer samples. It is vital to understand that we are not saying chronic fatigue syndrome does not have a virus cause. We cannot answer that yet, but we know that this virus is not causing it. And again, this is from the team at University College of London, Waltham Trust Sanger Institute and University of Oxford. They said, increased interestingly, we are using DNA-based methods to accelerate our understanding of the role of the pathogens in disease, explained the professor. These, these will drive our understanding of infection, but we must ensure that we close the circle from identification to association and then causation, meaning they screwed up. Thank goodness they caught, caught it. Otherwise, a lot of you may be treating for a virus or disease that has nothing to do with the ailment that you have. Now, one of my favorite articles, fluoride. The U.S. finally came out and said that we are getting too much fluoride. In a remarkable turnabout, federal health officials would say many Americans are now getting too much fluoride because we're getting fluoride out of everything. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services announced plans Friday to lower the recommended levels of fluoride in drinking water for the first time in nearly 50 years based on a fresh review of science. Not new science, but finally looking at science that existed for years, which the government failed to listen to, including their own scientists, which told them they were getting too much fluoride in the water. They said about two out of five adolescents have tooth streaking spotiness because of too much fluoride. And keep in mind this two out of five you'll discover is a round down from 41%. But there is also growing worries about the more serious dangers of fluoride. The Environmental Protection Agency released two new reviews of research on fluoride Friday. One of the studies found that prolonged high intake of fluoride can increase the risk of brittle bones, fractures, and crippling bone abnormalities as well as cancers. And amazingly, dental and medical groups applauded the announcement. They want to lower the maximum level of fluoride in drinking water from four parts per million down to at least two parts per million, which sounds like it's a big reduction, but not really. Because still, according to the CDC, nearly 23% of children aged 12 to 15 had fluorosis in 1986 to 1987. Now it is up to 41% up to 2004. The EPA unions, including one representative of the agency scientists, pleaded with the EPA to reduce the permissible level of fluoride in water to zero. Zero. Citing it can cause cancer. Britain's about one of the only countries in Europe that uses fluoridated water, and only 10% of the country does. The rest of Europe probably does it at all. Something to look at. Well, thank you very much for that. Thank you very much, Ralph. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for joining our show. Do your research. Look things up. Take care of your health. Thank you very much for joining us.